Let us turn in God's Word to Acts chapter 1. And uh, we'll be looking at verses 6 through 8, but I'm going to read the, the context of that verse. Uh, we'll read verse 4 and uh, through 11. Hear God's Word as we look at it together. And it's also found on page 965 in your pew Bibles. Hear God's Word. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Please be seated. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, Scripture tells us that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. And that is encouraging us that no matter how much time passes, no matter how many years go by in our life, or even in generation after generation, God is going to be faithful to his covenant promises, as well as he's going to be loving and gracious and patient with you and I, who humbly and repentantly look to him. But that fact that, that a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day with the Lord also tells us in one way, this New Year's Day is just another day in God's providence. Yet it's also good at times like this for us to think a little bit more about how we should purposefully live as we face the future. A future which the scripture tells us holds God's incredible blessings and, and untold joys for us as we wait for the promise of eternal life that's guaranteed for us through Jesus Christ. And even in the meantime, every good and perfect gift comes from God, as scripture tells us. God is blessing us with our daily bread and, and day after day with, with a variety of things so that we could enjoy and trust God now. Remember the old hymn, count your blessings, count them one by one. Even as we look over the last year and look to the new year, we need to do that. But also in God's wise providence, the future also, also holds unknown trials struggles and challenges. And while the devil means to destroy us through these, these are God-given opportunities to grow closer to him in faith and even to point others to the Lord in the midst of our tears. Because you think about it, you look at the psalmist, the, the psalmists are often doing that. And so it's important that as we begin this new year, that we think about how do we live this life through its ups and downs? How do we understand this time? And, and how do we live? In 1 Chronicles 12, 32, God praised the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the time to know what Israel ought to do. And it's reminding us that God's word not the world, not, not what a man thinks for a few years and is proven later is wrong. But God's word is to shape how we look at life and even the future <coughs> and how we live today. And in today's passage, Jesus is giving the disciples and us a command to follow. And so while we should understand, too, even as we look at this, while the devil tempts us to, to occupy our minds with the struggles and the failures of the past, or, or even tries to fill our minds with the fears of the future to get us to neglect the present. Jesus, though, is turning us from speculation to ask and to, to the task he sovereignly set before us, not just for a new year, but for all of our life. 
We need to ask, what does Jesus teach us? Well, in verses 6 through 7, the first thing he teaches us is don't worry or speculate about what we don't know. You think about it. This time, the disciples' minds were racing. Jesus had died the most horrific, excruciating death. It's the death of the cross. He was in the tomb for three days. He was certainly dead, and now he's risen from the dead. They had gone from the valley of despair and incre- to, to incredible joy of seeing their resurrected Lord over and over for 40 days. They knew this wasn't an illusion. He had proven himself the very Son of God with a power over Satan, sin, and death. And now before Jesus ascended into heaven, which they didn't think about that that's what he was going to do, as he ascended to take his heavenly throne, Jesus spends his time teaching them, including about the kingdom of God, as verse 3 shows. And so now, just they, they, this question is, is a burden on them. And they ask this question, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel, the disciples, and even the Jews today, even to this day, pray a prayer which is for the restoration of the glory days of the Davidic kingdom and the destruction of their enemies, that the world, and they pray for this, literally, that the world would become Jewish. And so the disciples, these these Jewish Christians who understood there's no break between the Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church, they thought in part, though, too, that Jesus now would be an earthly conqueror. We kind of like that, too, sometimes, don't we wish for that in our life? Or just defeat this sin. Or just defeat this enemy. So I can be done with this. And so they thought Jesus would, would conquer even and free Israel from Rome. They didn't really think about what was going to happen next. And as the ascension shows, Jesus' kingdom is actually not just over a little nation of Israel. It's a cosmic kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. Brought through the Holy Spirit working faith in our hearts by the preaching of the gospel. This is why Jesus' ascension, and, and as the gospel message has gone out, Revelation eleven fifteen tells us that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Eventually, Jesus will return, though. And his reign one day will be visibly uh, known to us when the curtain uh, uh, is pulled back on eternity at the end of time. But in the meantime, Jesus taught the disciples and us something important. And Jesus says this, It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. There are things we just don't know about the future, and it's not up to us to know. There's things left to the secret counsel and divine plan of God, and there's things that God has made clear so that we would know them. Deuteronomy 29, 29 tells us the secret things belong to God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children, that we may do all the words of this law. And just like the disciples, we're not to to, to worry about whether Israel would be great again or if it would be wiped off the face of the map, which it was. And so our ultimate concern should not be about our nation's future. We also shouldn't worry about how, what tomorrow is going to hold. Whether it's, it's going to be the time that the scripture talks about, that when the church has completed its mission, uh, as, as Revelation 27 tells us, that the Lord is, is for a time going to grant the devil a short time to rally uh, the wicked to attack God's people. We're not to worry about those things. And I know they estimate, in fact, a study just came out this week, 90,000 Christians, they estimate, were martyred because of the Christian witness. Last year, 105,000 were killed and martyred for the Christian faith. And that makes Christianity the most persecuted group in the world. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily the end of the world because Jesus said the world will hate us. It's been hating us for a long, long time. 
And neither should we join the crackpots who try to speculate about the time or age that, uh, of Jesus' glorious return. For Jesus has also said, of that day and hour, no one knows. Jesus doesn't want us to waste our time looking at the newspaper, trying to understand or fret about what may or may not yet happen. And it's not just true of the big things. It's true of the details of our life, too. I get asked from time to time, Pastor, what's God's will for my life? Should I marry this person? Should I take this job or that? Well, there's wisdom in many counselors, and we should be talking to godly, wise counselors when we're making decisions. But we're not to speculate about the future. All we can do is apply biblical principles. Does this person help me to serve Jesus? Does this job enable me to serve Jesus or his church better? Or should I take this job and move to a place where there isn't a good, good Bible preaching, a church striving to be reformed after God's word? You see, Scripture doesn't tell us all the details about our future. But God has made it clear that God's will for your and my life is our sanctification. That we become more holy, that we become more Christ-like. God's will is our sanctification, not our speculation. And we're to do things and make decisions which help us to serve Christ and his kingdom. And the rest we're not to worry about. We're to be content that Jesus knows the future. That he, as scripture says, declares the end from the beginning. And promises, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. And we have to know this. Even as the enemies of, of your and my soul lash out at us, Jesus will rule. He's still going to be directing the future according to his plan, and it's going to be for his glory and our good. And the reason Jesus tells us certain details is so that we would trust. Our God knows what's happening. He's not surprised by whatever may happen to you or I or to our nation. And whether we live in an, in an age of intense persecution for our faith, or we live in a time of a spiritual revival, our triune God is in control. And just so you know, it's always interesting. Sometimes those two come together. Persecution and spiritual revival usually follow hand in hand. Because if you talk to the Christians that were from the eastern satellite nations of Russia, those pastors are actually praying for their own persecution again because they look at that as the glory days of the church there in the east. See, one of the things, though, we cannot forget is God is in control, and he's promised in Zechariah 4.8. He says, I am determined to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Do not fear. See, God is determined to do good to his people and to his church. And he's done good for us through, through our salvation, through Christ. So we're not to worry about the future, but to cast our cares on him. And in fact, secondly, then he tells us and teaches us to be busy with the work God gives us as a church and personally. You know, there's a reason. God puts our eyes. We're not, we're not like uh, some lizards and things like that. But God has put our eyes in the front of our head to get us looking forward to what is before us and not looking backwards. Because Jesus wants us to see the tasks he sets before us day after day. And what's the work we're to focus on? Well, as a church and as an individual. What's the work Jesus empowered his disciples to do and, and even <laughs> us today to do by his spirit? Well, look down at verse 8. Jesus says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Uh, one of the things, in fact, we look at the verses before this even, he, he told them to wait. Sometimes we have to wait for God's blessings in this life. Sometimes it can be painful. Sometimes it can take a long, long time. But the promise to us, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
And the Holy Spirit now has come out because I was talking about Pentecost. But then notice what Jesus says to And you shall be my witnesses, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. First thing here to see is that the church, including you and I, are not left in this world to act on our own strength. We are led. When we go out to our jobs, whatever it may be next week, when we're with our family, when we're back home, we, no matter who else is with us, we are led and we have the presence of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune Godhead. If you have faith, the Holy Spirit's working in your heart. He's already with you. And so even if you don't know what, what's the point of your life tomorrow, for your studies, your job, whatever it is, your marriage, your family. God has given your life meaning and purpose through his saving grace to you. And while some of this, yes, is specific to the disciples, there's also a lot which still applies to us. We don't have to go literally to Jerusalem. But we start where we are and we move out from there. The main point, though, here... It, uh, that Jesus is making is our God-given life is one where God has empowered you and I to be witnesses of Jesus Christ to this world. Me to you now, then you with your family, with your friends, and those around you during the week. And I know before you, you start mentally putting up the wall and say, you know, but I, I, I can't do that. I don't know what to say. Uh, you know, Understand, the best preparation to do what Jesus commands here is first to live the life of faith in Christ today. To study his word day by day that the, his Holy Spirit would have our faith grow. And to be honest, being witnesses of our Lord's saving grace is not as difficult as we make it out to be. Because ultimately, even being a witness is not about us. It's about the Lord. And first of all, the Holy Spirit, that dynamic power which is at work in us to believe in the first place, promises, God promises, he will use your and my feeble deeds. I could not be a pastor without that assurance. Secondly, Jesus said, you shall be witnesses to me. In other words, tell the truth about Jesus. All that is promised in the gospel, which the articles, as the catechism says, of our Christian faith teach us in summary. That's the Apostles' Creed. We know that. We just confessed it. There's not one person, I don't think, that didn't say it. As Christians, we know it. We say it week after week. And so prayerfully, look for opportunities to tell others about just the small details of this. About God. His sovereignty, his salvation by grace. And when we speak about these things against the foolish inventions of mankind, our faith is, we have to understand, our faith is standing on the facts. The solid eyewitness testimony we have in the Bible. And, and speaking about any of these things, even in their details, any of the parts of the, of the Apostles' Creed is what we're called to do. And to be honest, in this day and age, we will stand out. It's what the world needs to hear because sadly, many churches are no longer talking about sin and salvation, about revelation of God and his word, not, not well, I got this revelation, this feeling, I got a tingle down my leg. Churches are denying miracles. They're denying justification by faith in Christ alone. And when we see the American people say all religions are equally valuable, when we see this nation trying to expunge any, any reference to Christ or his will, when, when Christians are unrepentantly living no differently than pagans, we can know we're living in an apostate time. But it's no different in many ways from the world that Jesus empowered and sent his disciples into. The simple message, the simple points, even of the Apostles' Creed. That was the center of their teaching. That's why we call it the Apostles' Creed. It's not what they wrote, it's what they taught. And it's what we're called to speak to the world around us. See, God does not want his truth or his grace, 
which he's graciously given to you and to myself. To remain hidden. He doesn't want us to light a light and hide it under a bushel. But he wills that this gospel light shine in this sin-darkened world even today. See, Jesus is not telling you and I that, that we've got to change somebody else's heart. Because honestly, we can't even change our own hearts. He alone can do that. All we need to do is to take the long haul view and to day after day, graciously, just in small ways even, point others graciously to Jesus. And yes, we are sinners saved by grace. And we're still sinners. But we're also sinners with a message to tell others. Who are we to go to? Well, the disciples were to witness to those around them despite facing persecution. If you think about how this, this sounded to them, he says, you're going to be my witness in Jerusalem. Well, Lord, they just crucified you in Jerusalem. Jesus said, speak to him. Jesus said, go to Samaria. Samaria, I mean, these are our arch enemies. They hate us, we hate them. And both for good reason. Jesus said, take the gospel to them. In fact, there's no limit to where the disciples and even us today need to take the gospel and be a witness about Jesus too. This is why Jesus adds, going even to the end of the earth. And we as a church and as individuals are, are to speak about Jesus far and wide. And in fact, that's what the early church did. Tertullian, a little over 100 years after Jesus, said it this way. He says, we have filled all the places that belong to you. Cities, islands, forts, towns, exchanges, the military camps themselves, tribes, town councils, the palace, the senate, the marketplace. We have left nothing to you but your temples. That was because women gossiped the gospel even as they did their laundry. Brothers and sisters in Christ, consider this. Consider this. One of history's greatest scientists and mathematicians, Blaise Pascal, was not converted to Christ through his scientific inquiries. No, it was when he was hanging between life and death. His carriage was about, literally about to fall off the bridge. And the only thing he could think about was the witness and the conviction of his sister and her speaking about Jesus to him. Here's this incredible scientist, one of the greatest in the history of the world. And what God uses to pierce his heart was the Christian witness of his sister. Jesus says, even to you and I today, you are my witnesses. Who does God call you to witness to? Well, pray about it. Ask the Lord to open your eyes to those in need right around you. But to be honest, think about those that you all are already speak to. They're the ones Jesus wants you to go to. Look for opportunities to spread just the small seeds of the gospel. You know, you're not planting a log on somebody's head. You're planting a seed. And in some cases, you're watering the seeds that somebody else has planted. And yet God will bring the increase as we speak. And this is what our ascended Lord sets before you this new year. And all of your life, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, encourage us by this word and deepen our understanding of, of your glory and what you have done and are doing through Jesus Christ, your Son, for us, out of love for us. And Lord, we pray, help us to focus on that. We, we know there's so much uncertain about the future. We don't even know if, if this will be our last heartbeat on this earth. So keep us from presumption, from speculation and foolishness. Give us a passion to do what you have clearly revealed and command, to be your witnesses to our neighbors and even the nations, even the end of the earth. Strengthen our zeal and our obedience, even our confidence about the future. For you, our Savior and Lord Jesus, are reigning on high. You've already conquered the devil, sin, and death. Assure us of that, even in our own lives, as we still struggle with our sin, as we still struggle with doubts. Lord, we thank you that you are paving the way for us. You're interceding for us, working in our hearts, and guiding history to your appointed end. And you are even preparing us for heaven. So make us bold, Lord, not in our strength, but in your strength. 
and help us as repentant sinners to be humbly faithful witnesses to you in this lost and dying world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.